Hi, and welcome to another episode of Talk with Confidence. This is where we have inspirational conversations with inspirational people. Today we have a truly inspirational guest uh, in, in, in the studio. Uh, his name is Decent Nklamolo Waloi, or is it Nklamolo Decent Waloi? He'll correct me. <laughs> He'll correct me. But he's a, he's a young academic. Uh, he's also a lecturer at the University of South Africa. Decent, welcome. Thank you, man. Yeah, thank you for, for, for uh, accepting the invite, man. <laughs> yeah, it's an honor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so you're a lecturer at the University of South Africa? Yes, I, I lecture at UNISA yeah. uh, in the College of Economic and Management Sciences. Wow. You know, when, when we think of uh, lecturers, we usually uh, imagine uh, these old people, you know, <laughs> grey hair, <laughs> uh, the belly coming up to here. But you're a young man. I mean, you're barely, you're not even 30 years old yet. No. So no, no, no. how did it come that you, 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 you know, you became a lecturer at such a young age? Uh, look, I've, I've, I've always um, looked into being part of the academic uh, um, sphere, you know, I always mm. wanted to be in academia because of the influence that academia has on people mm. and the influence that it has had uh, on my life uh, personally. Yeah. So uh, it was just a personal choice that, uh, that, that I took. Yes, um, it is uh, the traditional uh, <laughs> thought is that um, Academics are these old, yeah. <laughs> old folks who are approaching their best before. But, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it's becoming younger and younger. Yes. It's becoming younger and younger. It's becoming mm. more appealing to young people. Yes. And hence you would find even young people with doctorates, uh, mm. young people who are getting into the academic field because, mm. uh, because of the global need for fresh ideologies and fresh minds. Fresh insights. Yes. Wonderful. I mean, from a, an academic point of view, your own studies, your own qualifications, uh, you've got a, a master's, I believe, and then you're also doing your PhD. Yes. Can, can you just take us through, you know, what was your first degree and, you know, getting up to where you are right now? Look, I enrolled for my first degree at the University of Pretoria in international relations. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it's, it's a, 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 a discipline which I enjoyed very much because mm. it taught, taught, taught it has a very broad spectrum of teachings um, mm. from economics to politics to mm. developmental studies you know, mm. where you get to understand a variety of disciplines mixed mm. together into one qualification mm. so it mm. was it mm. was something that I but also I, I had a very keen interest in issues of the public service mm. uh, and hence I did my um, honors degree in public management public and administration, mm. yeah. which I completed. After completing that, um, I needed to focus a little bit more on leadership. Mm. So leadership became my focus <coughs> area. Uh, during my honours, um, I, I, I looked into, I found very much appeal in mm. leadership, mm. especially public service leadership. Mm. Uh, and hence I did my master's, uh, master of philosophy in Responsible leadership, responsible leadership at the right. Albert Lutuli Center for Responsible Leadership that's Wonderful. in Pretoria. Mm. So, yes, um, and now uh, pursuing the doctoral degree in uh, leadership and ethics. So, we'll be calling you a uh, Dr. Molo. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> you just a yeah, man of time. A, yeah, just a, <laughs> A uh, few years, yeah. Just a few years. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, man. That's inspiring. Yeah, good. I mean, you, like you said, there are more and more younger people going into the academics field. Yes. Why do you think that is? What, what is the value of, of, of this particular sphere? Look, we, we need to sustain uh, knowledge. Mm. And you cannot sustain knowledge if you, have, if you only have seasoned people mm. or seasoned academics. Mm. You need rookies yes. to enter the sphere mm. so that the seasoned researchers and academics can mm. sort of impart knowledge mm. to the young ones, you know? Um, we work with really seasoned academics. We mm. meet with uh, proper scholars mm. you know, and researchers mm. um, on a daily basis. Mm. And some retire, mm. uh, we lose some. Mm. And if young people do not enter this mm. um, sphere of academics, mm. we'll get to a place where we no longer have knowledge, we no longer have researchers, you know. Mm. People develop yeah, a new people, knowledge. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, one, one of the advantages I imagine of, of uh, younger people like yourself getting into the academic sphere is that there is fresh 
knowledge. You know, young people always come with new ideas that perhaps have not been explored, have not been explored at length yeah. by the older generation. Do you find that to be, to be true? Yes, it is. Um, because the, the, the younger generation, mm. in my view, mm. I mean, we need to start to question mm. how things have been done. Mm. We need to start questioning the mm. methods because mm. across time, mm. methods have to change and transform. Yeah. You know? mm. We cannot be using the same methods mm. to remedy mm. problems that we had Hundred years, years ago. Hundred years, mm. years ago. You know? so, mm. And sometimes the seasoned guys mm. do not have mm. the the capacity to do that mm. because they are used to the rigid, yes. non flexible way mm. of mm. solving problems. Mm. You know, and there are problems that seasoned scholars cannot solve. Mm. You know, it needs new, new it fresh needs minds, new blood. Mm. Uh, it's, it's it's a problem of context sometimes. Mm. You know, um, mm. we are in a context where the relevance of young people is becoming bigger and bigger. Mm. So we do need, academia does need uh, a lot of young people mm. uh, to also assist mm. um, and to better and to improve on mm. the thinking of the seasoned scholars as well. Mm. Mm. Because um, we, we, we're living in a generation where there is a lot of youth issues mm. you know, which are understood also by, by young the youth, By younger guys. So yeah. We cannot... Um, expect mm. uh, the older generation mm. to understand or fully comprehend some mm. of the issues that we have mm. because they did not go through those issues mm. you know? we need to do it on a on an introspective level yeah you know, because and, and i mean if if you were now as a, as a young person you're on the ground mm. you're interacting with youth every day you understand the dynamics better than somebody who who's you know at a, at a arm's length from yes, from those yes, issues yes. so even when you write about those issues or when you research those issues mm. it's it's stuff that you know you you've come into contact with and you can contextualize yes. in a better way yes and, and 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 by saying that we cannot reject the necessity of um seasoned scholars yes. seasoned academics because mm. They ground us. Yeah, you know, true. They true, give us true. grounding. The roots. So are we come. Yeah. With, we come with all these <laughs> nice ideas, and sometimes they are rejected. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to speak about this yeah. nice new method to develop something, but yeah. they will ground you. Yeah. And say, hey, folk, can yeah. you? <laughs> uh, so, so, so it's, it's it's a balance. You need to find yeah. a balance. Yeah. And where they fail, we come in and usher new yeah, and usher new ideas. Yeah. You know? Uh, but where old ideologies uh, fail, mm. the new ones can come in and assist. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you touched on something that I'm also quite passionate about, uh, leadership. Yeah. And you said you, you did your master's thesis on responsible leadership. Mm. What is responsible leadership? Look, responsible leadership in essence is to, be, is, is, is to take cognizance of Mm. the effect that your actions or words can have on the next person. Mm. So what you do mm. doesn't necessarily have to be towards someone or what the, the decisions that you make today, mm. what impact can they have mm. on the next person? Mm. You know? and, and do you believe that South Africa or Africa, one, one has to have an Africa focus in mm -hmm. fact, do you think responsible leadership is being practiced on when we look at Africa broadly and what needs to happen, what needs to change? Look, the, the debate on leadership is one that enjoys no universal understanding. Mm. You know? um, and by that I mean that there is no real grounding or definition of to, as to what this concept is. is. Yes. It, it still enjoys <laughs> vagueness. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Because we speak of different types of leadership. Mm. And on the African context, if we speak of Africa and we have to introduce Africa, we have to take it back, mm. years back. Because mm. remember, Africa is, is not... In Africa, traditional governance was practiced. Yes. You know? yes. And we are now in an era of democratic dispensation. Yes. You know? yes. So now we have to query what are the compatibilities mm. of traditional governance mm. and this leadership mm. that we, we, we have. We've always had leadership. Mm. We speak of traditional leadership. Yes, We've yes. always had leadership yeah. in Africa. Mm. It's just the mode of practice mm. of this leadership. The kind of leadership, the, yes. the, 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 the philosophy kind, of the leadership. The philosophy behind the leadership mm. Mm. that we are practicing. Mm. Um, 
how compatible is it to modern day principles of democracy? Mm. You know? So, I mean, in, in Africa, one of the problems that are there is, is leaders who do not want to leave office. Mm. They want to, I mean, case in point, mm. our, our neighbors. Yeah. You have people in leadership who, who essentially say they want to die in leadership or mm. they want to be in leadership mm. for up to a point where they can no longer even, even take, yeah. you know, 30 steps. Uh, what, what? Obviously, that presents a couple of problems. I mean, you, you were talking in the academic field that, you know, you have the old guard, but you always need new, new, new academics, new leaders to come to the fore. What problems do you believe that presents in an African context? The, the fact that, you know, the, the, the style or the, the, the notion is that I should be in leadership until, until, until. I think one of the issues regarding the African context mm. is the issue of the philosophy, mm. uh, our thinking uh, in terms of what leadership means. Mm. Uh, the misconception generally and mm. universally is that leadership is a position. Yeah. And it isn't necessarily a position. Mm. Leadership is influence. Yes. So you can be in a position for mm. 30 years mm. and have very little influence. Mm. But you can, there are some people who can be in a position mm. for a few years, mm. but have so much influence. Yes. I'm reminded now of the late Thomas Sankara, mm. who didn't enjoy so much time mm. as um, the Prime Minister mm. of, of Burkina Faso. Mm. But his influence we still feel, feel it today. today. His, his ideology, his yes, philosophies yes. are still permeating society. So it's the thing. So it's the philosophy oh. to, to, to stick in one. Um, position mm. because they make it about position they mm. have made it about position mm. without understanding what it has to do with people gaining influence mm. from what i say mm. what i do mm. and my interaction with them mm. you see and you impacting them in a way i have to impact exactly and it has to bring in some sort of change yes you know mm. if those things do not or are not clear are not mm. evident mm. then I, I i i'm tempted to say it is not leadership. Mm. It is not leadership. It is simply a, a position that you are occupying. occupying. There's, there's an African proverb I like, I think it's from Ghana. It says, a big chair mm -hmm. does not make a chief. Yes. So the big chair is the position, but it doesn't mean that yes. you, are, you are in fact a yes. leader. You, you because, go, mm. because that very same chair can be occupied by the next, a, a teenager. Yeah. And that would make him, him a leader. Yeah. But, but the chair does not make the no, leader. No, it doesn't. You, you, you mentioned uh, Thomas Sankara. Mm. I mean, uh, we've had some really great leaders on the African continent, uh, the likes of the Ghanaian in Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah. Yeah. And, and several others. I mean, even in the musical field, uh, the likes of uh, Fela. Fela Kuti. Fela Kuti. And... I mean, we've had so many great examples of, of what leadership should be, especially on the African continent, with, you know, with, with the back, back, backdrop of colonialism yeah, yeah. and apartheid and such, such, uh, such a, a phenomena. What, what do you believe needs to, to come back in that? Because the caliber of leaders from that era or from those specific uh, individuals, the caliber of leadership hasn't really risen to that particular level. What do you think needs to change in order to bring that, that revolutionary spirit of, yeah. of, of true African Renaissance back? You, you are touching on a, a, a concept that I'm, I'm really busy with at the moment, which I'm introducing in a research study that I'm doing. Mm. The concept of care. Mm. Uh, leadership with care. Mm. Uh, leadership not just for the position, but caring. Yes. Um, about the people. Yes. You know? Mm. Uh, the moment you lose connection with the people, mm. the people who are supposed to benefit from your um, influence, mm. the moment that connection is lost, mm. the chances of your leadership being ineffective is high. Mm. Because your concern is no longer about now the people, mm. it's now about what I can gain. Mm. You know? Mm. Um, the, the, the people you mentioned, um, your Fela Kutis, mm. your Thomas Sankaras, mm. they've always been concerned about the people. Mm. If you look into their uh, writings and what has been said about them, mm. their speeches, mm. they're, they're concerned about people. Mm. Um, if the concern is about people, if you care about people, mm. then your, ac your actions will show mm. that in actual fact I care about these people 
and what I do mm. should benefit them mm. uh, more than it, it should benefit, benefit me. me. Seven, some term it sevenhood. Seven two. Sevenhood leadership. We have, we have yeah, seventh leadership. You know, mm. I'm there. Uh, the, the the basis for that is service. Mm. I need to serve you mm. because you know you know. I mean, let's look at government. Government is there to serve the people. That's the primary role. Mm. But a lot of leaders, especially in government positions, uh, look at it and say, "You must serve me." So they've got it the other way around. No, it's completely the inverse. Mm. Uh, it should be turned around. Mm. Um, that's why you're called a public servant. Yes. You're not called a public recipient. <laughs> I like called, that. You're called a public servant because you have to serve Sir. the masses. You know? Exactly. Um, exactly. You have to, when you're a public servant, mm. I believe mm. uh, personally mm. um, that if you're a public servant, mm. you have to do everything within your power mm. to make sure that the citizen mm. is happy. Mm. Especially if you're working for government. Mm. Because it's an office. Exactly. You're a professional, you're a servant. Yes. It's an office and you've taken upon the responsibility and the duty mm. to be of service mm. to the next person. Mm. Uh, because you've been equipped with the skill mm. to be able to serve that person. Mm. So I get into an office, mm. um, I need assistance or something, mm. you're able to assist me, you should assist me. Mm. Because that is what the public service is there so for. Well. Yeah. And, and your, your doctoral... Um, or your, your thesis or your PhD thesis is based on exactly that, I believe. It's based on um, ethics, training and management in the public service. In the public service. Yes. Ethics is, is, is another interesting, interesting uh, topic because it, it, it delves a little bit into what we've been talking about. It's, it's about me serving you, not me gaining from, 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 from the public coffers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Do you believe there's an ethics issue in Let's look at South Africa, in the public sector. Mm. Do you believe there is an ethics issue look, that uh, needs to be dealt with? Before, before we even get into the public sector, society mm. in general. Mm. Uh, one colleague of mine asked last year, mm. um, is South Africa an ethical society? Mm. A question to which I still have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the occurrences of everyday South Africa and everyday public service mm tend to show us that mm. in actual fact not necessarily we are not we, we, if you were to ask me and I had to give you an answer now mm. I'd say no South Africa is not an ethical, ethical. society mm. I don't think there's a society which is ethical because mm. we do wrong each and every day mm. uh, we do wrong there's always reports of um, misconduct, misconduct corruption money, yeah. so it's, 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 it's not Mm. My, my answer to that is no, it's no. not an ethical society. And I mean, when you do research, obviously, research involves investigating what, what the issues are mm. and then the remedies mm. to those issues. Mm. In your research, uh, obviously, I don't want to give away your, your thesis or your, <laughs> your thinking, but in your research, are you delving into what the, the solutions could be? I mean, turning, turning a country like South Africa yeah. into to become more ethical and what are some of the processes and procedures that it's, we need to go into? Because we're dealing with ethics mm. and the only problem with... The concept of ethics, there's no problem mm. because ethics is just ethics. There's mm. no problem. The problem is that it has to be practiced by humans. Mm. Uh, the human element is a problem <laughs> and it will always be a problem. <laughs> you know? But what uh, it? Yes. <laughs> Because there's a policy that says, do not do this. Yeah. And the folk will do the same thing. So our problem is... It's not the, the policy. It's society in general. And yeah. in, 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 in what I'm trying to do mm. is we've got a lot of legislation mm. and policies that deal with ethics mm. in the public service yes. and ethics training. Yeah. And we've been praised uh, across the globe as a, a country with a very stable and solid constitution. Mm. Um, but the way in which there's been so much corruption mm. in f from I mean even before the democratic era mm. there's been so much corruption true, true, true. coming into the, democra the democratic era there's mm. still a lot of corruption mm. rampant corruption if I should say that. Mm. but then you ask yourself what are these policies doing mm. what, what's, what's the relevance of these policies mm. that is where my question came in mm. um, which moves me into my studies mm. because then 
I, I, I shouldn't probably disclose too much of it because it's an unpublished yeah. thing. <laughs> That's why I wanted it. It's an unpublished yeah. thing. But the idea behind that is to uh, develop models mm. in which we can align basic um, and higher education mm. in terms of ethics education. Mm. Um, so that by the time, so for the public service to also benefit from it. Because mm. um, to come up with a model of um, ethics training and management that is mm. different to the current one that is being used because mm. it seems like it's ineffective mm. because mm. we talk about uh, by the way the constitution speaks about that every public servant should um, promote a high standard of professional ethics mm. that is the first principle that they mention in chapter 10 of the constitution mm. but that high standard is not necessarily seen mm. by all mm. or experienced um, by or, those or, who are supposed to be getting the yes, services they are not uh, it's not experienced mm. um, i mean it's 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 a dire strait it's mm. a dire strait so you 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 mentioned something um, that i quite like and i want to latch on to a little bit you say it even in 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 the basic for me, when you say basic, it may mean even going into high school level. Yes, from when mm. a child goes into, into the schooling system. Mm. Because by the time they come to the public service, it's mm. late. You've, I mean, you've, 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 it's, it's, it's the, late. the habits, the, yes, yes. The, 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 the norms of behavior have already been at, at foundation level, yes. have been set. It's and I mean, somebody has been behaving in a particular way. You may find the past, the, the folk are stealing uh, uh, sweets yes. in primary, yeah. uh, high school, they were snatching yeah. uh, cell phones. Yeah. And but then when... <laughs> it's 15 million, which is at my disposal. So why? I've been, I, I have the character of, of, of taking. Yeah. Um, without consent. <laughs> Yeah, and it, 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 it goes. Yeah, it, it goes to. Well, it becomes in culture. Yeah, into in, into your. It's your entire philosophy. Theft, yeah. theft becomes your philosophy. Your philosophy. <laughs> and, and and now you you don't know I care mm. because this is public money. Yeah, which should be benefiting the public. Public. Yeah. So it, it goes back to that responsibility thing in yeah. leadership. Responsible you know? leadership. Yeah, because what are. I, I take 50 million mm. from a budget of 150 million. Mm. I take 50 million and I keep it to myself. Mm. Um, mm. Then it's supposed to serve a particular purpose. Mm. It means there are kids who are going to go hungry. Yes. There are people it's, who, it's a vicious cycle mm, every time. Mm, every time. Mm, mm, it reminds me of a quote by I think it's Frederick Douglass who said, it is easier to um, build strong children mm. and to repair broken men mm. you know I like uh, that. that's why my concern is to see if we can find an alignment yes. from and, and and we must not neglect also um the importance of home uh, the, the, the importance of the home mm. in terms of educating children because ethics has to be entrenched in it the home to, as well it's something you have to live. Mm. You have to live. You don't mm. necessarily. That's why some there's a debate whether you can teach ethics or not. Ah. And you learn ethics, you know. Mm. You learn it so mm. by seeing, by observing. Mm. And if you have it from a young age, mm. there are good examples. There are so many good examples of people I know who've, mm. who've come from good backgrounds and have been taught well mm. to do certain things. Mm. And they grow up with it, you know. Mm. They grow up. But if you don't have that, mm. um, it's it's. It becomes a problem. So essentially, ethics is everybody's responsibility. It is. It is everybody's responsibility. From yeah. a, from an academic point of view, Mr. Waloye, uh, soon to be Doctor Waloye, <laughs> what do you want to achieve? Look, um, academically, yes, uh, short term uh, is to complete the doctorate um, mm. and also continue to contribute to the body of knowledge. Mm. And we have a huge responsibility among us, uh, be, uh, upon ourselves as academics, is that. Mm. We have to continually mm. be at the forefront of contributing to the body of knowledge. Mm. And we have to solve societal problems mm. through research. You know? mm. And that is one of the things that I'd like to do, mm. to produce groundbreaking research mm. uh, so that academia can benefit, so mm. that the public service can benefit, mm. and so that society at large can benefit. Mm. You know, we talk about the knowledge economy. Mm. You cannot advance a knowledge economy mm. if you are stagnant in mm. terms of reading mm. and researching. Mm. So, I, my wish for myself is to continue mm. um, 
participating with other scholars mm. and society mm. in terms of finding solutions mm. to the social problems that we have. Mm. It may be little, um, but you eat an elephant bit by bit. You exactly. Know? Exactly. Uh, we'll get there at some point. Wonderful. Research upon research, we'll mm. get there. Mm. Uh, that research will solve a problem somehow. Mm because it's problem-based, so mm. we will we'll be able to solve problems somehow. And I mean, in the near future, uh, I've, I've always loved this concept of professorship. Mm. <laughs> it, 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 it always sounds, sound, you always hear these folks, yeah. uh, there's an associate professor, yeah. uh, a full professor, a, an extraordinary with, professor, with, with, with those, with with those, those caps heads, yeah. of hers, uh, that you see when you attend. Yeah. Uh, uh, graduation and stuff. Yeah. It's also that type of, type of an interest that mm. you're able to profess knowledge. When you're a professor, you know, you, you profess. profess <laughs> you're, you're a big shot. No? <laughs> <laughs> but but um, it's 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 just the the, tra the, the trajectory of um, mm. academia. You, mm. know? you develop, and as you develop, as you produce research, you mm. get to professorship, mm. and perhaps maybe later into more executive positions. You know, oh, like no, I see you there. Entire... I see. I see you there already. No, uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a nice thing to have. Yeah, but a huge responsibility. No, no, but with time, with time, time of course, you have to. I mean, develop yourself mm. such that you can be able to take the pressures of such a high office. Mm. You know, it's Definitely. like uh, yeah, it's like it's it's like. If if you've seen the oath that the president takes when he assumes office, yeah. you can see that it's a heavy office. Yeah, there's a responsibility, yeah. responsible leadership. Yeah, responsible it's leadership. Responsible leadership. If if you were to say something to a, a, a young person who is thinking about going into uh, academia, the academic space, and maybe they're a bit reluctant, or there are people saying, "No, man." Uh, don't go into that. It's, it's some deem it to be boring. There's so much reading, so much research, so much this and that. What would you say to that young person? Look, um, it, it, it looks like, I, I think in general society will think that academics has to do with reading. Mm. Academia does not have to do with reading alone. Mm. Academia mm. is there for knowledge. Mm. Uh, knowledge comes also from interaction. Mm. You, know, you interact with people. Mm. Um, a young person who would love to join academia and has that type of mentality. Mm. Um, the thing about academia is that you, it, it has to, something in you has to be fueled. You know, mm. The love for it has to be fueled. Mm. And you, you get that fueling as you go, as, as you interact with academia. Mm. You know? mm. uh, but the opportunities to influence mm. are much bigger mm. than in so many industries. In so many, exactly. Because your work is seen throughout the world. Mm. You publish a paper and it's seen throughout the world. Mm. You know? Whereas in another office, what you do in the office remains in, in the, the office. office. Mm. Uh, mm. But mm. in academia, if you want to influence mm. a, the multitudes mm. through research, mm. and it's interesting because you are there to solve problems. Yes, exactly. You, it's a high office. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a high calling. Mm. Yes, it's a high calling. Mm. Uh, others would say it's the equivalent of being a high priest. <laughs> Because, but it's, it's believable. I mean, if you look at the robes, yes, uh, that uh, are done. Uh, what they call the regalia? Yeah, <laughs> the regalia, the academic regalia. Yeah, it's 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 in line with that. Yeah. You know? Look, uh, academia. It has to. You have to respond to the calling, mm. and if you don't, you won't find it interesting. Mm. But it's such an interesting, you know, to to solve a problem mm. through thinking. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so rewarding. Yes. Because thinking is, is problematic. You know, there's a, there's a quote I like. Uh, I think it's by John C. Maxwell. Yeah. He said, A minute of thought is more valuable than an hour of talking. True. <laughs> I, I, I had one professor say in one of the sessions I attended that yeah. the most important thing to do yeah. is thinking. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> in actual fact, um, I sit with um, our, uh, uh, um, I had a conversation with our head of department. We like to interrogate this concept yeah. of thinking. Yeah. Because uh, it's, sometimes it's difficult. Yeah. Think, because you can, you don't know, what are you thinking? Yeah. You, 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 are your thoughts going to contribute to yeah. uh, the body of knowledge that yeah. you're trying to advance? So, mm. so it is difficult, but you, you teach yourself to think, mm. you know, through mm. reading and 
and uh, interactions. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, wonderful, Mr. Waloi. Yes, I'm gonna call you Dr. Waloi. I'm gonna call you Professor Waloi. <laughs> Because I have full confidence that you're going to reach there and you're going to make an impact on this generation and the generations to come. Well, I appreciate uh, the confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, sir. It's been a pleasure, man. Hey, tada. That was inspirational. I'm inspired. I'm sure you've been inspired. And you've been watching Talk with Confidence Conversations that inspire. Do tune in next time right here on Global Conference Television. Hey, tada.